many, many different <laughs> times, um, what we think is required. From my personal experience, just um, to share a bit more, um, Jason suggested we talk a bit more about our personal experiences as well. My name is Hui Ling, I'm co-founder of Grab. Um, the way to describe Grab used to be we're the you know, Uber of Southeast Asia. Uh, unfortunately, though, that description no longer holds. Earlier this year, uh, we were in a fortunate position where we could actually acquire their assets in Southeast Asia. Um, so right now, they are a shareholder and partner of Grab. And moving forward, um, we're building what we think is Southeast Asia's super app, everyday super app, and we've moved into things like food deliveries, payments, healthcare, financial services, and, and more to come with all the partners that we have. So about six plus years ago, um, I was in a position of, you know, have a great idea. Should we start it? Should we launch it? With my co-founder, Anthony. At that point in time, we were less concerned about, hey, uh, is this something that it's likely going to succeed or not yet? Because we were still focused on the problem, trying to see whether it had legs on its own before we actually went out and tested and iterated. So we went test, iterate, innovate, change. Test, iterate, innovate, change. And it started as early as access to um, other VCs, other ex-entrepreneurs, getting their thoughts and insights into our business plan. So from that perspective, I would say it's a huge part of the, it depends. Do you know what it takes to actually launch this business? Do you have good people to actually debate and discuss it with? You know, whether it's partners, you know, co-founders, because that's where you make all the mistakes that you try and make as soon as possible before you actually need to go out there and build a team and invest and build a product and actually spend real money. Because if you can do that as much as possible beforehand, that will be ideal. But what if, I mean, really the lens around here is what is distinctive about this region around ASEAN as compared to other regions? So everything else being equal, if I was in the US, or if I was in China, or another ecosystem, is there, are there distinctive things here that would make you optimistic or pessimistic? I would say six years ago, I would be very pessimistic, to be frank and honest, because there were no real big existing startup names um, that had been successful, that were able to do things at a scale of Southeast Asia, the region that became household names that others could look up to. Um, folks have said that Grab hopefully is helping to lead that wave with many other great startups and leaders as well. So I am more optimistic now, but again, it still depends. Very good. I would also say that Southeast Asia is the land of opportunity. Because that the, uh, there was no historical you know, ecosystem of existing successful entrepreneurs and startups and businesses, everywhere you look around right now, I see opportunities. I see inefficiencies, I see opportunities to me, they're the suit. Uh, there are two sides of the same coin. Thank you. Simon? Um, so you might kind of look at me and think, what the hell is he know? Uh, the, you know the old guy from Europe who's only been here six months, uh, working, uh, running public policy as well for, for Facebook. Well, I guess I've got two observations to bring to, to the great question, uh, Jason. Is I do work for a company that was founded by a 19-year-old. Um, uh, in Mark Zuckerberg, famously found, you know, dropped out of college and found the Facebook, which became the company that I and I work for. Uh, and Facebook, like every company, was a startup uh, once. I think it's fair to say that Facebook really could have only started in the U.S. 14 years ago. Uh, there was really no nowhere else in the world uh, where they had an ecosystem to enable a startup, uh, a, a digital startup like Facebook, to grow. Uh, in the way that it did in the early years and obviously uh, what we're achieving now. Uh, so that's, that's one observation. But, the, uh, so, but what I'd say in terms of the 19-year-old the now or the, or the school or the, the, the uh, university graduate is there's never been a better time uh, to be trying to uh, you know, follow, follow that dream. Uh, you've got a brilliant idea. There are so many opportunities uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, for you to be able to grow that idea into a business and to, um, and we're going to hear from others on the panel who've got more expertise about where you're going to get some money uh, to, uh, to really uh, get that idea off the ground. And then when you see a platform like Facebook, you've got an incredible opportunity to market you know, your product, um, it, often spending really very small amounts of money initially to grow it locally. Uh, and then in time to grow it across this uh, incredibly open 
diverse region uh, and a place where people are eager for the new. Um, so I, I think it's a, a, an amazing time to be able to do that. But of course, uh, there's so much depends then on you know, how good idea is it, really? Yep. Um, uh, and then whether other people will buy into it. And I'm sure others have got something to say about that. Thanks. Ray? Yep. Um, maybe I'll share a little bit about Snapcard as well as a company, and I'll share with you two reasons why um, I would first be pessimistic on that hypothetical question. So first is Snapcard is a company we collect offline data, and we aim to be the reliable offline data solution. So we work a lot with global companies like Procter & Gamble, Unilever, L'Oreal as our clients. And the reason why I'm pessimistic is because in order for us to engage with these clients, then we need to create credibility. And when we talk with, for example, a marketing director of Nestle and saying that, hey, we have a solution to answer your offline data gap, then if I'm a newly graduate from, let's say, Harvard, then that credibility would be much less compared to, let's say, if I work for Procter & Gamble for nine years. Right? So, so that's, that's one reason. Now, the second reason is because um, one of the sectors that we're uh, disrupting is the market research sector. And as we know, market research as a sector has not been disrupted for close to 100 years. So this is a sector that is very traditional when it comes to looking at statistics, sample sizing, looking at the data in a robust manner. And what we have is a solution that is going from an angle that is totally different because we're leveraging technology to ensure that there's a strong, robust data from the offline side. And to be honest, if we start this uh, 10 years ago, then Snapcard wouldn't work because the infrastructure was not ready. So then the depends question is related to whether the idea is ready in that time of infrastructure, whether there's a readiness of infrastructure itself. Uh, but then, coming from an ASEAN uh, local person, I see that people who are disrupting the ASEAN market has a much better advantage compared to people coming from outside of ASEAN because there are certain local knowledge that you need to have to really make the startup work. And uh, one, of the reason, uh, one of the examples that I would like to share is um, we are collecting receipts as one form of our <coughs> offline data collection. And um, to be honest, Indonesia and Vietnam in particular are the two countries that are they're the worst country in terms of receipt structure. Right? <laughs> it's not as structured as um, if you go to the US or if you, if you go to UK. There's so many things that we need to crack barriers on and you do need to have local knowledge on that part. Thanks, Ray. Eddie? Yeah, uh, if you asked me when I first visited Vietnam in 2001, I would have been incredibly pessimistic about tech startups, but you could already see back then the regional opportunities. Uh, more than a decade later, I, I moved back to Vietnam full time, uh, joined 500 Startups three years ago. Uh, 500 Startups is a global VC firm based in San Francisco. Uh, I run one of the funds focused on Vietnam. And so in the span of several years, I went from being pessimistic, seeing a non-existent startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia, to dedicating my career to it, to joining a firm that is now, uh, has been the most active VC firm in Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, that's incredible, and it's, it's driven by a lot of uh, things that we didn't put our finger on, and some of the things that we, we, we try to help out with, obviously, like access to capital. Uh, one obvious thing are the macros, the, the rapid macroeconomic growth, the conversion of now a majority of people in ASEAN having uh, uh, internet access, which uh, happened at a very fast rate compared to certain other regions in the world. Uh, investing in early stage startups like Grab and seeing, proving that founders in Southeast Asia could be just as good or better than founders in other places that also help build the, the, the foundations of an ecosystem, whereas before, uh, as was mentioned, uh, there weren't previously examples founders who could be looked up to, who could be mentors uh, for, for the new founders. So, um, and finally, uh, this nuance that is different across different ASEAN countries is the kind of environment that you're in. So on your hypothetical question, if, uh, if you're a young person in Western Myanmar, I would say <laughs> very pessimistic right now mm -hmm. uh, about setting up um, a startup. But if, uh, for example, you're a fresh graduate 
out of a university in Vietnam where tech entrepreneurship is now a national passion and the government talks about turning Vietnam into a startup nation and you know, it's now acceptable to parents to let their kids go into startups rather than work in corporate jobs. Uh, that's all mo much more encouraging. Now, of course, starting a startup even under those circumstances is really hard. Most will fail, but definitely a lot easier, uh, a lot more possible now than years ago. Well, I guess you guys, I mean, a way to put it is you guys are all testimony to the optimistic, right? Because you're here. Right? You could be in other places, but you're here um, doing your startups. So, Landra, what, what's your view on this? Um, First, uh, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I've worked at Sequoia Capital now for 12 plus years in India and Southeast Asia, and we've been investing in startups in this region. You know, it's, uh, uh, I, I think we are on a journey. Uh, as, as, uh, as Southeast Asia region or, or India, we're on a journey. I think it's very, very clear that every passing year is significantly better than the prior year. So the good news is the access to capital, the access to opportunity is significantly increasing. Now, that being said, I actually believe, I've always told founders, whenever they've said, hey, capital is not available, etc., I've always told them to believe that it is. Uh, there is no, uh, at least in the, in the vocabulary we possess when we think of startups and innovation, there's no uh, word called pessimism in it. So that, that word doesn't exist in our vocabulary. And we think founders do magical things from nothing. And, and they have the hustle, the tenacity, the perseverance to make incredible things happen uh, you know, even when the world around them might think that, that there's no hope. And uh, case in point, I'll narrate a, a very short story. Uh, I think most people in the room may have heard of a company called Tokopedia. It was started uh, many years ago in Indonesia. And the founder did not come from a pedigreed background or from Harvard Business School or what have you. And, um, um, uh, you know, he, uh, when he went to raise seed capital, he diluted a majority of the stake of his company, he, he diluted more than 50% for $100,000, uh, you know, in that day and age. And, uh, you know, case in point today, Tokopedia is worth several billion dollars and is, uh, you know, market leader in Indonesia in e-commerce. And if, if William could, you know, have that incredible run and go on to build a highly successful business in those types of circumstances, you know, I think every founder today should feel thrilled and delighted and fortunate that the market is so much more positive and there's much more institutional capital and a better environment and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, our view is uh, founders don't look for excuses. Founders look for the slightest. They, they need only one ray of light to believe that there's a sun on the other side of the door. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why they're founders. And, we, and I always remind founders, you know, when they're going through their moments of, uh, of, of feeling like, hey, there's not enough capital, not enough believers, I always remind them, hey, why did you become a founder? You did not become a founder to have things easy. So uh, at least we are very optimistic. We keep encouraging as many young people as we can, uh, no matter how young or old, uh, including trying to support students and others to turn founders and entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And we think, uh, you know, today more than ever before, anywhere in the world you are, you know, the ability to build something with open source tools with very little capital, the ability to distribute it on Play Stores and other m mediums with, again, with very little capital, and the ability to see success, you know, overnight is unprecedented. Uh, at any time in history, you couldn't say that as, as, as much as you can stay, say today, and I think the future will be even better. So, uh, so maybe I'm, <laughs> you know, um, uh, very optimistic. For well, you're you're a venture capitalist. Region. You're meant to be optimistic by, uh, by nature, right? Sorry? So you're a venture capitalist. You're meant to be optimistic by nature, right? Be optimistic by nature. Kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. True. So I think we're going to come back to this, the, the mentality of founders um, in a second. But I'd like to drill down more on, on the nature of this market. So we've heard some comments saying that this is an incredibly diverse market. And I guess if you take ASEAN as a whole, it's some 600, 600 million people. But that's as a whole. Right? That's, that's assuming that you can put the different markets together. I'm interested in the panel's views is, is this, is this really one market? Can, can you think, as founders, as platforms, as investors, do you think of this as one market or do you think of it as, a, as an aggregation of very distinct different markets? And how do you navigate that in a, in a, in a startup journey and in, a, in an investment journey? Who wants to have a go at this? Looks like an it. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, just, just to frame this, right, and the reason why it's so important that we think about this in, in different time spans in the journey around the last five, six, ten years, things have changed dramatically. Um, 
At Grab, my co-founder and I have always strongly believed that ASEAN is stronger as a whole than any individual country. We've seen it in the financial crisis. We sink together, we swim together, we fly together. And only if we could bring the region together in a commercial viable entity um, would we then be able to build it to a world-class state. And that has always been our belief. It's the reason why we focus on ASEAN and we have to date still only operate in ASEAN countries. So eight countries, 234 cities right now. But we have and truly respect the fact that they are very different countries and cities. A lot of similarities, but tremendous differences as well. Forget about language currency. Just think about how people purchase things, what they value, what the customers want and don't want. Tremendously different. At the same time, there are also a lot of similarities. We all want value for money, mm -hmm. we love our food, and we want to get from A to B and don't mind jumping onto a bike for that. Right? <laughs> so knowing all of that, what do you need to do to bring it together? Yeah. Because again, as individual entities, there is growth, or individual countries, there is growth potential, but it's significantly capped, and it will never be able to reach, I guess, what we call world-class status. What we did was we ended up building a global infrastructure and you know, talented technology bench. So right now we have six R&D centers globally. Three of them are in Southeast Asia, Singapore, Vietnam, and Indonesia. And three of them are actually from where we think most of the talent usually comes from, China, India, and the States. We did this not because we thought it would be fun to operate across different time zones, but we knew we needed to, considering that there was no ready pool of engineering and technology talent available in Southeast Asia at the scale and seniority and expertise that we needed. So that was something that we knew we had to invest as a platform and think about it as foundations to a house. Beyond that, then think of different rooms in the house. And each one of these we tailored and we interior design to whatever the local teams and cities and countries wanted. Here, we got the best local talent, and I see some faces in the room from the Grab team, right? We found the best local leaders who were equally passionate about what we cared about, and we empowered them as much as possible with this technology, with resourcing, with know-how across the region to go localize, hyper-localize, understand your customers, figure out what products would work, and select from that many of products that we have now developed to say, hey, you know, food works in this city, it doesn't. Even in this city, a concierge model works or a fully integrated model works. They are all details, but once you really understand what it means, it has a tremendous impact on the customers. Does this fly from a, so as investors, right, if a founder came to you and said, right, we're gonna tackle the whole region. Right, we're, gonna, we're gonna do every country at once. Um, simultaneous execution. What do you guys think of this? How, you know, in terms of the, the sequencing <laughs> of things. Like right. Uh, so, you know, the, the general idea in startups is to start small and fail fast, and then once you s sort things out, then you move to the next thing. So I think, think starting simultaneously across multiple markets, multiple products, multiple whatever is probably not the best idea. <laughs> but uh, I do like founders coming to me and saying that they have a big vision that goes well beyond their city or their country. And I do think that there are a number of teams who have that opportunity. Obviously, Grab and Snapcart was one, are, are two of them, uh, but they're not the only two. Uh, there are many of them that have this kind of regional, even global ambition. Um, I like your analogy of the, the different rooms in the house, uh, not just from uh, localization to serving a local market, but in terms of grabbing different resources from different parts of ASEAN. So yeah. A, an in, economically integrated ASEAN would be easier for business expansion, but then at the same time, a, a, a somewhat fragmented ASEAN gives rise to the ability for different countries to start to develop different s strengths. And if a founder can, like Grab, pull the strengths from each country they're operating in, then they can be even stronger than if there was a more homogenous market. Um, you know, Indonesia is obviously a large and fast-growing market. Thailand has great designers. Vietnam is going to be, according to IBM, number three by a number of engineers in the world in five years. Um, 
every country in Southeast Asia is a heavy user of Facebook and <laughs> YouTube and so on. Um, so the commonalities on the Facebook and Google side give rise to commonalities in consumer behavior, but then the differences in education and, and, and values and interests give rise to the talent differences, for example. Um, and companies that can get across the region uh, are able to scale beyond it and are probably, in my opinion, stronger than their comp counterparts in certain other markets like the U.S. because they've already experienced the, the pains of going across borders. Uh, Sequoia and, and uh, 500 are investors in a couple of shared companies that have demonstrated this. Um, we'll, we'll keep the names under the radar for now, I guess. <laughs> to be clear, we started small. The yes. Malaysia is a taxi ride hailing <laughs> company, but we have visions for more. Excellent. I just wanted to pick up on one of the things that Eddie said around that um, you know, Facebook kind of ubiquitous across the region, and we certainly see uh, many different startups that um, are able to use our platform to grow their businesses, and particularly when they want to go international. So when they want to go to another country, we can help them find um, an audience for, or a, a customer base which is like the one that they found in their, in their local market, and those products work, work very well. But what also Facebook can do is recognize that countries are different. Uh, the, the way that Thais use Facebook is quite different from the way that Vietnamese people use uh, Facebook. You know, some much prefer video to others, uh, and we can help small businesses understand that, and, and, and startups understand that as they're navigating how to use a platform uh, like ours. Uh, and you know, I, I'm still learning the region, right? So I don't want to, I'm certainly no expert, but what I see, um, frankly, a little bit like Europe really is um, there's a lot of similarities. I mean, Europeans like their food as well. They t some of them really like drink quite a lot, um, but they really love food, they would say. Um, but there's also a great variety. What's very different here, of course, is you haven't got a kind of forcing mechanism of the European Union to try to you know, really bring, harmonize legal frameworks. Um, uh, and it doesn't seem to me that you need it uh, in this region. Uh, there's uh, there's a, a, enough cooperation uh, going on. The only worry is if you start to see countries, not because of their concerns about startups, but more concerns about other issues, that they start to try to make it, uh, that they actually make it harder. So I think that's, we may want to come back to that, but, um, uh, but I, I certainly see here there's, a, there's enough um, kind of shared enthusiasm for the digital economy, for startups, uh, for ASEAN not to need the kind of superstructure that the EU has developed yes. in order to enable uh, the, the benefits of a, of, a, of a huge regional market to be, uh, to be there to, for all to play for. Yeah. Please. Um, so I just want to emphasize the importance of local knowledge in bringing ASEAN together as one. And let me share with you a little bit of a story that I had 12 years ago because I was part of a team that is a pioneer in my previous uh, company, where we're trying to actually create a go-to-market organization that is ASEAN as one. So it was 12 years ago, and we had tremendous challenges. It's not just about the fact that there's an Indonesian base in Bangkok handling a Vietnamese business, <laughs> uh, but it's also because there, there are things that are very localized that we didn't understand at that time. Even one of the things would be regulation. Mm -hmm. So imagine that if you want to sell a bottle of shampoo, then you need to print all of the different languages in the same part of that back of the shampoo, um, and we need to market to all the countries. And apparently, it's, it's hazardous because you need to have five, six different legal guys to look into the same bottle, and it's, it's, it's a lot of mistakes that, that were done at the time. So fast forward to today, and, and I can say that it, was, it failed miserably. So it was uh, disintegrated into different countries again right now. But, but fast forward to today, what I've seen is if you are able to actually attract the right talents leading the local markets, that will be the key success to create ASEAN as one. Um, for example, Snapcard, we have, we have a CEO who's Indonesian, we have a chief data officer who's a Filipino, we have a chief finance officer who's from Thailand, and we have a chief strategy officer for, from Singapore and a revenue officer from Malaysia. Was that done by design? No, it was pure luck. But it really drives the thinking and knowledge that we have about ASEAN as one. And that's what makes us um, quite successful today. Thank you. 
Can I um, return to this distinctiveness of this region um, and ask about what sort, what are the problems, what are the big problems that startups in the region are solving now? What are the distinctive business models? I mean, are they, are they largely de derivative sort of business models of, you know, um, US companies or Chinese companies? Or are we really seeing a regional distinctiveness come up? Do you think, Salandra? Yeah, we, uh, we had a little bit of a pre-panel chat, so this is an uh, um, easy question for me to answer because we had a discussion already about it. <laughs> Dude, you gave it away. Thank you. <laughs> so I will... Um, um, uh, we, we have this framework where we, uh, you know, often, often local startups are criticized in India, Southeast Asia as being clones of something in China or clone of something in the U.S. And uh, at least, uh, you know, I've been espousing for a while that you know, we think of startups as clones, mutants, and new species. And, uh, you know, clones uh, solve a known problem in a very uh, sort of known manner, and uh, they're trying to blindly copy what happened. The much more interesting startups are the mutants, where, you know, the problem is known, but the solution is highly localized, and so they're, they're actually doing new things, and often mutating very fast. I think, you know, um, Grab and Gojek are great examples of mutants, where, um, you know, I was personally involved in the Gojek journey early on, and you know, within weeks of launch, within first four or five weeks of launch of their transport product, they launched their food delivery product. And within uh, a few extra months, they launched their payments product. And, you know, to this day, I don't think, you know, the way they have and Grab has prioritized payments and financial services, I don't think companies in other markets have. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, sometimes we make simplistic comparisons between models, but actually uh, what we find is that the models mutate a fair bit and actually makes them very much more powerful than just simple clones. So we find in Southeast Asia, it's true of India, it's true of China, that models are mutating quite fast. And at least in our opinion, what's happening is they are no longer thin layers of technology. They're trying to transform very large industries in what we call is a much more of a full stack manner. So, um, you know, companies are effectively trying to disrupt retailers, you know, uh, transportation, banks, uh, etc. cetera, in a, in a much more of a holistic fashion than just provide a layer of technology, which is what you might have found, you know, five or ten years ago. And I often ask the question, hey, is WeWork a technology company or is it a full-stack hybrid company? Similarly, we have a company called Oyo Rooms. Is that really just a thin layer of technology or it's full-stack? And we think it's the latter. And what that does is the addressable market for these companies becomes humongous. So our view is that the tech startups of today are going off to very large markets, and um, have a shot at disrupting by essentially tweaking business models and, and mutating uh, to, to, to new and more interesting models. And I think we see that a lot in China, Southeast Asia, and India. Anybody else have a view on that one? I mean, on capital, I mean, the other thing around derivativeness is, is around capital as well. So it's not just the startups. Are there distinctive um, regional indigenous um, angels, uh, venture capitalists, funders of startups that are purely regional and they're not derivative of, sorry to pick on you, yeah, but not sure. derivative of big US <laughs> venture capital firms or big Chinese um, um, financing uh, firms. What are we seeing in the, in, in the funding community? Yeah, I think others can chip in and Eddie, you should add as well. But, you know, I, I think there will, be, there will definitely be long-term two distinctive flavors. There will be folks who do only regional investing and then there will be firms like ourselves who will do regional and global investing. So, uh, and, and I think that's a good thing for there to be a mix of both kinds. Um, and I think it's the same is true of uh, China, the same is true of India. Uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's need for both effectively in the market, for there to be very focused regional uh, pools of capital as well as global pools of capital. Yeah, I would agree there's already uh, a f a quite, amount, uh, <laughs> quite an amount of diversity uh, from local angels all the way through VC firms, uh, buyout firms, corporate venture, that sort of thing. Um, depending on who you ask, there is somewhere between a half billion to a few billion dollars of dry gunpowder. Um, you see lots more deals these days than you did, you know, six years ago when Grab was just getting started. Um, but I think there's still uh, a way to go for the capital market in Southeast Asia to develop. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it has to do with the investors. Uh, correct me if you disagree. Um, there are a lot of new investors in the region who are uh, perhaps more risk averse than their counterparts in 
Silicon Valley, obviously, but even uh, China, they uh, may be less familiar with the ways uh, that traditional tech investors look at companies and support companies after. They may be more traditional in how they structure the deals, which from their perspective, based on the you know, industries and expertises they come into it with, makes sense, but from a venture game perspective, from a long-term tech startup game perspective, can be pretty debilitating if they're not too careful. Uh, so some of our work, uh, besides actually going and investing and supporting in companies, is actually helping to get the region's investors on the same page about all of these factors. And I gotta say, things are a lot better than they were. Um, I, I think there's still work to be done. Things are definitely better now than they ever were before. Um, <laughs> it's, it's funny still today when I go meet certain, uh, let's say, American or European investors, it's funny to realize that they really don't know much about Southeast Asia. Um, Southeast Asia, each country, its city is so complex and different that sometimes the only way to get them to understand is to bring them on a plane and put them in the middle of Manila or Ho Chi Minh City or, and then say, hey, now you can rest in Singapore for a bit, right? Um, and, and it's that understanding, it, that true visual and internal understanding that was lacking before. And again, much progress has been made. We have much thanks for 500 startups and even Sequoia. You guys have been helping a lot in, in building the region, and we have much more to do. So from that perspective, as a company, we've actually realized that we also have a part to play on this. A few months ago, we've launched uh, our Grab Ventures program, and recently we announced that we've dedicated a pool of 250 million US dollars specifically just for Indonesia um, to help more local startups and you know, entrepreneurs figure out how to get from different stages, especially within the growth stage, just because we know we understand their challenges and it's more difficult for them to have to go out and convince someone else who has less no, uh, local know-how. And more important than that, I think it's not just the money. It's really the understanding of, hey, you have a problem right now that is super nuanced and localized to whatever customer segment in whichever city, in whichever country you're serving in Southeast Asia. Guess what? We know what you're talking about. Here's how we thought about it, right? Here are the mistakes we've made, and here's how we can hope to work together to help you avoid them. Now, we can't guarantee what we've done was the only thing to do or the best thing to do. In fact, we continue to make many, many mistakes. But what we're hoping to do is reduce those you know, ratios and improve the hit rate for them so that we as an ecosystem can grow. Because I wasn't kidding. When I first started this conversation, I, I shared Southeast Asia is a land of opportunity for me. And for us, what we care about is growing it as a region. And, and we want to have as many partners as possible. And we're bringing in you know, US, you know, Chinese, local um, resources to do that, and the best global and local partners for that as well. This is a good segue into this question of capability as well. I imagine some of it is cyclical, right? You have a lot of funders, um, venture capitalists, who are successful founders who've exited their businesses. It's a, it's a cycle that turns. So presumably, as there are more successful exits and more successful companies built, there'll be more funding that goes into the ecosystem. When we talk about capability here, um, I mean, let me, let me ask the panel, is there a culture? Of, people talk about this culture of entrepreneurship you know, acceptance of failure, risk-taking. Um, is there a culture of entrepreneurship in ASEAN? And is it consistent across the, the different countries and jurisdictions? Maybe I'll start, yeah. I think uh, some more experience in the region yeah, so, <laughs> and, and I think I'll, I'll divide the culture of entrepreneurship into two parts. One, who are truly entrepreneurs. Second, will be the ones that follow the entrepreneurs because that's actually a culture of entrepreneurship as well. And, and the way I see it is, it seems that the culture of entrepreneurship in, in ASEAN is, is very rich. Um, example would be, if you go to Indonesia, you'll see more than three million mom and pop stores that is really a traditional market that is basically run by entrepreneurs, right? The same thing if you go to the Philippines, you'll see a lot of the Sari Sari stores they are run by local entrepreneurs. 
And, and the way I see it is that um, it, it basically culminates not from the culture itself, but also the, the infrastructure on how you drive entrepreneurship. And honestly speaking, I think I'm quite blessed to be part of an Indonesian founder uh, team where the government is really helping us to get to that next stage. Right? And, and the government really sees that, okay, apparently in Indonesia, there's a big gap when it comes to funding. So in, in the early stage, it seems that there's quite abundance of investors that are interested, but then when it goes to Series B, Series C, then there, there will be a challenge. So then the government initiated a very strong program called Naxicorn, uh, which is short for Next Indonesian Unicorn, where the government really provide a roadshow to different countries where they basically um, really focus on bringing on that later stage startups that they, they see will be prominent enough to bring to those countries. And, and also there are some leeways that, that are given to the startups where um, when I started the company three years ago, there were quite a lot of hurdles when it comes to even creating the company, the legal entity. But now it's becoming very, very easy. Hmm. And that is driven by the fact that the government supports that entrepreneurship culture that we want to bring. Yeah. Thank you. Let's, I'm just conscious of time. We're going to start opening it up to the audience um, here. So if anybody would like to ask the panel a question, I can't see you uh, very <laughs> well from here because, first of all, my eyes are bad, um, and secondly, it's quite dark. But if you could, if you could raise your, your hands if you have a question for the panel, please, um, uh, please do so. In the meantime, um, just, just again on this capability thing, gender participation um, and, and startups um, across the region, um, it's on this panel, you know, where you're the, you're the only woman on this, on this panel. Can you talk to us a little bit about you know, the participation of women um, and entrepreneurship or innovation as, you know, as empowering for, for, for women? And, and what are some of the initiatives, what are some of the optimistic things you're seeing around that? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to broaden this to diversity as a whole, right? And I think it's a super important topic that Ray alluded to in his earlier comments as well. Knowing that Southeast Asia is in itself so colorful and diverse, the only way we could truly develop the best, uh, continue to develop the best solutions for our customers is to make sure we have a diverse team as well. And like Ray, we were in a very fortunate position where we ended up with an extremely diverse team. We have more than 40 plus nationalities in Grab right now. For context, we're six years old, and if I'm not mistaken, there's about 45 nationalities. Um, our you know, male to female gender ratio were more than 40% female, and I, I get to be one of those few co-founders that say 50% of our founding team was female, right? Um, <coughs> nevertheless, Anthony and I never went out and said, hey, we need to hire like, the most nationalities ever. We need to keep an eye on the number of females that we're bringing into the pipe and hiring and whatnot, because to us, all that mattered was we brought in the best people, the best leaders, the best grabbers for the specific role that we're hiring for. And when you take away the lens of, hey, do they have you know, the right skin color, the right gender, the right age profile, the right hairstyle, it really becomes a much easier problem to solve yeah. for. But it is much easier said than done because the funnel itself is highly influenced by the pool that's available. Mm -hmm. So especially for engineering talent, the number of available you know, female engineers is much less than, let's say, uh, any, any other function that we could hire for. Mm -hmm. So we are at the same time trying to change that. At Grab, we have amazing leaders, you know, whether it's women at Grab, we're working together with universities, with other companies, with NGOs, to help shape the future of what we think the employment um, landscape needs to look like to provide the best opportunities for all. So. Yeah, and actually I'd say this is a, a, an issue in which it feels to me that this region is actually leading the world, certainly for our company. So we have a, a um, program called She Means Business, uh, you know, obviously SMB, uh, that started here, started here in this region, uh, led by a colleague of mine, Claire Devi, that some of you may know, uh, and it's, it's She Means Business, which is a program of um, uh, encouraging and enabling and training 
uh, women to be entrepreneurs or to support them in their entrepreneurial journey uh, uh, using uh, Facebook's platform. That started here in this region. It's now something that we run globally, uh, and we've, uh, we support uh, ten, tens of thousands of women every month to, to, to grow what can be, as you put it, a mom and pop business, or it could be a technology business, uh, and, and to use our, our platform for that purpose. So, and I've worked in other parts of the world. I used to be responsible for the Middle East. Um, that's not a great place to be a, a female entrepreneur, but it's getting better. It's getting better, but compared to here, uh, I think that, that there's much more uh, equality uh, and an opportunity here that I've seen in my limited time here, but also talking with my colleagues who've led that work. But on diversity, I mean, I guess, to be honest here, um, we all come from very privileged backgrounds here. So if you overlay a gender issue with, say, a poverty um, issue as well, I mean, really, entrepreneurs who are coming up, um, female entrepreneurs or any entrepreneurs, you know, been to Harvard Business School, excellent educations, what is the ecosystem really like for the vast majority of the population in ASEAN? Yeah, I mean, going, addressing that question, also going back to the, the prior comments as well, uh, agree that Southeast Asia appears to be better than at least the US if you look at percentage of large company CEOs who are uh, women. If you look at percentage of funded companies, at least in, in the purview that I have, that have a female founder, uh, we do as well or better here than we do in other, uh, other parts of the world. Um, but there is still a gap uh, on gender. There's a gap in other things like uh, um, you know, the, the socioeconomic status as well. And it comes down uh, partially to that even though we're doing better here and even though we try to say things like let's just hire the best people we can hire irrespective of where they come from or let's just invest in the best founders we can, there are implicit biases, there are structural biases uh, that, are, that result in these skews and numbers. Um, I think nowhere is it more stark than the poverty question. Um, it partially, uh, you know, it's sensible, it's hard to be a tech founder if you come from a family where you didn't use the computer when you were growing up. Um, and that is something that really has to be systemically addressed, uh, not you know, addressed by governments in terms of getting internet uh, penetration out to rural areas, addressed by governments or private sector education uh, in terms of digital literacy, um, uh, more work on the private sector in terms of plugging those folks into the broader networks like we're lucky enough to have here at the forum. Uh, and there's a lot of work to, go, to do. Uh, it's, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis when we're looking at investments, we try to be both, you know, look at it from two angles. One, being blind to background and the other being, you know, very cognizant about background and trying to understand whether we'd come to the same decision and if not, why not? And it's, it's become very clear when you look at uh, our portfolio of companies here in Vietnam uh, that there's still work to be done all around, including with us. Um, many of our founders have uh, had experience overseas, have studied or worked abroad, or have come from abroad and moved back to the country. Um, it gives them benefits like uh, you know, international business knowledge and maybe critical thinking and so on, but the optimal situation is in the long run that you don't have to have left the country to get that same ability. And uh, that's something that I think about every day. Questions from the audience? Any, I think I see a hand over there. And then one here. Hi. Hello. Yeah, hi. Um, very good afternoon. Thanks for the very insightful and formally um, discussion from the panel. My name is Lisa. I'm from Asiata Group um, and Asiata Digital. Um, I know that the, the um, topic is startups, but there's also a conversation around the government and how partnership with other that needs to happen as well within a startup community. That's number one. Number two, the perception that startups is cool, lenient, cowboyish kind of thing. How does that actually relate to um, the processes or quote unquote governance? Do you guys embrace that at all in your organization? And if you guys do, what triggers it to be implemented? Because I know as a beginning, you may not have a proper processes or, or, or uh, plans in place, but is it a trigger by number of customers? Is it triggers by number of employees, the size of your organization? 
Thanks. What I suggest, why don't we group a few of these so we can tackle them together. So there was a um, question over here and there was a question at the back. Why don't we group these in threes? Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Miranda Johnson. I write for The Economist magazine. Um, I've got two questions. I'll try to be quick. Um, and they both, I suppose, come under the category of dealing with governments in Asia. Um, the first, uh, perhaps, um, you know, more towards, um, you know, Grab's experiences of scaling in the region. Um, obviously, there um, have been difficulties with uh, regulatory authorities, uh, competition law, in many countries in the region is nascent. And I was wondering if we could hear a little bit about Grab's experiences from the more positive, um, given you know, the recent approval in the Philippines of its services versus the greater difficulties in Singapore. The second question um, for Simon, if I may. Simon, obviously uh, Facebook has come under fire um, for its response to events in Myanmar. And I wondered if you could talk about the difficulties of managing um, such crises and how they're communicated on your platform. Thank you. Thank you. And one last, uh, just in this group, there was, a, there was a hand up the back there quite early. We got, we got a microphone to that person. Hello? Hello? Can you yes, hear we me? can hear you. Yeah. My name is Mayan Villalba. I'm from the Philippines. And uh, I feel sad that there's no Filipino in the panel. Um, I teach uh, entrepreneurship. But in my classes, I find that uh, those who graduate to become entrepreneurs are what we call the COO, children of owners. <laughs> And the, those with lesser assets and experience usually become their employees. Mm -hmm. So um, my question is, um, what would be the, uh, we can see now that uh, assets, resources is one factor, but what would be the other facilitating factors for young people like you, very inspiring, to take the path of entrepreneurship. And the second question would be, what would you tell governments and our government in particular? Thank creating you. a policy environment that supports entrepreneurship, especially among the young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quite a lot of questions here. What I propose, why don't we move down um, the panel from this side, <laughs> starting from you, Shalandra. Which question would you like me to take? <laughs> so whatever you want to tackle. So we had three groups. It was around the importance of partnerships and, <laughs> partnerships and governance was the first set. The, the second set was a Grab-related and a Facebook-related question. And the last one was around the children of founders. How do we facilitate more young people into entrepreneurship and, and the role of government? Yeah, I, I can start with the last one. It's uh, something we are passionate about, about how to encourage more young people and also women in entrepreneurship and so on. And um, uh, this is an area we are pretty passionate about um, uh, at our firm and always want to, um, you know, encourage people to take risks and to be able to dream. And, and uh, I, I, I think I, I don't know the exact circumstances um, uh, in, in the Philippines and, and why the COO concept exists, but I, I, I have a suspicion that it has something to do with uh, financial assets, but it also has something to do with context. So perhaps the kids who have come from business families have seen this context of entrepreneurship in their families and have grown up around it, and therefore for them it's natural and for other people it's not. And you know, I, f I find that the presence of role models is a very big stimulant uh, in, in new markets uh, for, for people to become entrepreneurs. And so you know, I really feel uh, you know, I've had a chance to see how the India entrepreneurship market evolved over the last 12 years and I think once a few role models got established, you know, uh, a lot of young people started believing that they could do it too. 
And so I really feel like the presence of role models in each of these markets is going to facilitate many more to turn entrepreneurs. So I think we are at a point in time when, in a way, that's, that's already happening. So the success of Grab or Gojek or Tokopedia or other companies or Shopee um, is, I think, already creating a much bigger wave of entrepreneurship today than it was in the past. Also, many of these platforms are enabling others to become entrepreneurs on top of them. So, you know, Tokopedia has many people who will become entrepreneurs on Tokopedia. Let's say they'll launch their own brand or their shop or whatever. Similarly, many people will become entrepreneurs off of Grab and Gojek and so on and so forth. So I think this wave is going on, but, but perhaps I think a lot more can be done. Um, so we are trying to, for example, support nonprofit institutions that encourage. We just uh, agreed to sponsor just a few days ago uh, an institution in Indonesia that's called Generation Girl. And uh, it's a nonprofit designed to help bring more uh, women into um, engineering careers so that women can become engineers. Because, you know, there's the stereotype that, that, that uh, uh, most of the time that, uh, you know, more, more uh, men are found in engineering roles. And, uh, you know, we found a wonderful set of uh, volunteers from Indonesia who, who wanted to start this. And, you know, we were immediately uh, attracted to their vision and said, hey, we'd love to support and, and, and let's make this big. I think similarly, this past weekend, some of our team members were volunteering in Singapore to actually um, coach and mentor student founders who are in their teens. Uh, and they, they came back blown away, saying, you know, today's teenagers will, you know, make us all feel like, you know, we, um, you know, we were nowhere at their level when we were that, that young. And so I, th I think the younger generation is definitely, um, uh, you know, sort of moving in that direction. And I think, I think we all should, should sign up to do a lot more uh, Thank you. for enabling this. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, I'll focus on the partnerships question around building an ecosystem. And I would say that there are stakeholders across any city or country that need to be involved to really optimize. I'll, I'll touch on a few points because this could be a whole other panel topic. Uh, but I do think uh, the government has a huge role to play uh, in terms of rolling out internet uh, penetration, getting digital literacy on board, and uh, also with uh, upgrading the education. I'll use Vietnam as an example. Vietnam is fantastic with math and science. That's why there can be uh, so many engineers coming out of here. Uh, the education system lacks, for example, in critical thinking, creativity, and, and so on. And uh, that's something that we need the government to do, to, uh, to, to get involved with, to kind of help overhaul. Uh, besides government, it's obviously uh, families. Um, families getting uh, their heads around the transformations that are happening and getting more used to the idea that uh, family members should be allowed to try and fail. Um, we see that in pockets here in Vietnam. That's how Vietnam rose out of poverty over the last 30 years. Uh, but it's still, there's still a, a certain fear of failure. And then uh, finally, in terms of the corporates, um, just because we're running short on time here. Uh, but uh, of course, there are a lot of traditional businesses in all these countries in ASEAN. Uh, they need to be very clear about the importance of digitizing and the role that uh, young entrepreneurs can play in helping them digitize, or else they might be competed out by these young entrepreneurs uh, in, in the next few years. So, Thanks, Eddie. Yep. Great. I'm just conscious of time. So sure. we're, these are almost going to be sort of like last, last words here. So Ray? Yeah, I just want to um, answer the remark about startup being cowboyish. So, uh, and I do hope that I represent a lot of startups in ASEAN. We are taking risks when it comes to trying to crack that business model, but when it comes to people, we don't. We do want to actually focus on what is the right culture and foundation on processes. And, and it, a lot of startups that I talk to are really focusing on that from day one. Um, that includes SnapGuard. And the way we see it is when you focus on processes, a lot of the issues, even when it, when it comes to diversity, for example, and, and I echo Willing's uh, comment where if you actually focus on the skill sets, then you don't really need diversity initiatives. When you focus on a very objective process, then the diversity will come by itself. And, and that's why SnapCard has 40% female employees and 50% of our co-founders are female. Right, so. yeah, thanks, Ray. Right. So, um, I'd love to talk about startups in Myanmar. Uh, I don't think as a company we've really yet earned the right to be able to do that. Um, we've said very publicly right to the top of the company, we, we were too slow to address abuses of our service in Myanmar, but we are making big strides. We've still got a long way to go. I really hope that in due course, uh, it would be wonderful to have a Myanmar uh, person here uh, representing that country and there are 
digital startups there, but it's very nascent. Uh, and I'd love in the future for be able, us to be able to be in a position where uh, people want to hear from Facebook about entrepreneurship in Myanmar uh, rather than other issues. I'll cover two quick topics, the Grab specific question and the COO question. Um, I, I think we approach government relationships like we do with every other partnership, right? With our customers, with our corporate uh, partners, as well as our government partners. We see it as a relationship, a journey together, and not a task to go do or not do in one meeting. And it's because of that continued approach over the last six years, we've had the fortune of going through what I would say the typical ups and downs of any relationship, right? Some conversations go well, some conversations don't, but as long as we mutually keep our eyes on the same end goal, we'll ultimately get there together. As long as we're both willing to listen and adjust our practices accordingly for the greater good of the people that we're ultimately serving, we will get there. Right. The second one, just to end on a joke. Uh, on the COO, <laughs> I'll use myself as a case example. I am both a COO and not a COO. I'm chief operating officer for Grab, and I am not the child of it, an owner. So hopefully that gives you an example to share with your students. That's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Everyone, we're out of time. Um, unfortunately, apologies to those who had questions, and we didn't have the time to address them. But thank you um, uh, to the audience. Would you all thank me, uh, join me in thanking the, uh, the panel today? I think just. I think just as final words, um, the things that I found really um, distinctive about this was just the distinctiveness, the distinctiveness of this region, um, that it is not a derivative of any other ecosystem out there, that really ASEAN is developing its own ecosystem, and that we should really look forward and strive for the day when there is any young person um, who comes from a poor family can equally participate um, in this eco ecosystem and create something as successful as some of the entrepreneurs here have created. So thank you very much. Thank you.